Well, and now it is my pleasure uh, to be joined by Crystal Bonds and Harold Levy. We are really honored today to have two individuals who have spent their careers ensuring that students receive the knowledge and support necessary to have a successful life. Harold Levy is the executive director of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. He is best known for having been the first non-educator chancellor of New York City schools, serving for three years starting in 2000, including during 9-11. Prior to working for the foundation, Mr. Levy headed the EdTech investment practice of a venture capital firm and was special counsel to a special situations distressed debt hedge fund. He also served as the executive vice president of Kaplan Inc., where he started Kaplan University's online school of education and as the director of global compliance and associate general counsel at Citigroup. Mr. Levy received a BS from Cornell University in Industrial and Labor Relations, an MA in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics from the University of Oxford, and a law degree from the Cornell Law School. Governor Hassan, thank you for your leadership in this um, process. Um, sessions like this give us an opportunity to really think about the core issues behind um, education open up questions that are otherwise rarely addressed and I very much appreciate the opportunity that you've given us. Thank you. Um, as you heard, I'm the executive director of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, which is dedicated to supporting high achieving low income students. Um, the way to think about it is it's road scholars for poor kids. Um, the Cook Scholarship is the largest scholarship available. Uh, I say that without fear of hesitation, uh, without hesitation of being contradicted because it's up to $50,000 a year, last dollar scholarship in goods and services. We give it in the seventh grade for high school, in the twelfth grade for undergrads, and most relevant to this, uh, to the secretary's comments, to transfer students from community colleges seeking a four-year degree. I can tell you that as we sit here today, we've got three students going to Oxford next year. We have a relationship with the university, and two of those started off in community college. It's actually quite fascinating because um, if you get a Cook Scholarship in the seventh grade uh, and you carried on to grad school, it could mean up to half a million dollars. Um, it puts in perspective both the cost of education and the fact that we have lots and lots of extremely talented kids who wind up in community colleges um, and perhaps are uh, capable of going to four-year institutions but don't go there for other reasons. Secretary Perez, Perez spoke eloquently about the demand uh, driven training, the skills superhighway, and employer needs, and certainly about apprenticeships. And Crystal Bonds has spoken very eloquently, I think, about her efforts to bridge the gap among employers and government leaders. I want to shift the conversation a little bit and talk about a different kind of gap, not the skills gap, but the excellence gap, and it relates. What is the excellence gap? It is the disparity in the percentage of low-income versus high-income students who reach advanced levels of academic performance despite having identical capacity. What's that about? The data here is pretty devastating, and I must say I did not understand this when I was schools chancellor in New York. If you take the kids in the top 25% on reading scores in the 10th grade, and of those kids, take the kids who are in the bottom 25% financially, whether by wealth or income. So you've got very smart, very poor kids. Fully 22% of them do not take the ACT or the SAT, and 23% do not go to college. I found that stunning. I always thought that if you were poor, and smart, you could write your own ticket. And that turns out to be simply not true. And the reason it's not true is that these kids feel they, they don't see themselves going to college. They have pulls on them by family. 
And it is quite an extraordinary thing in this country where we pride ourselves on the American dream of social mobility that these kids do not have a chance. And it's almost a fifth of the poor kids at the very top of capacity. And it's not just that they're, they're not going to school. The ones who do go to school, as I alluded to before, are undermatched. So they're often not going to the best schools that they're capable of getting into. The numbers on, uh, of, of the numbers of how many go to the selective, the highly selective colleges is quite extraordinary. If you're a high income kid and you're in that top echelon, about 46% go to the highly selective schools. And if you're a poor kid, 17%. That's not America. The numbers continue, they're ugly. The number, the, the amount of time it takes to get through college, longer if you're poor. The number of kids who actually graduate, fewer if you're poor. And the number who go to graduate school, about 20% fewer if you're poor. That means they're not becoming architects, they're not becoming lawyers, they're not becoming accountants. It is a serious, serious problem. I say again, if I'd known this data when I was school's chancellor, if it had been generated, I would have done things very differently. The kids, these high-performing, low-income kids, turn out to be extremely fragile. They drop out because they think they don't belong in college. It's too expensive because they look at sticker shock. They see the number and don't understand that, in fact, there's a discount factor. And I must say, I know some of this firsthand. The quality of counseling in the high schools, I don't need to tell you guys this, is abysmal. The caseloads are too large, the training is too poor, and the kids don't have a sense of outreach or embracing. The workforce ramifications of this are pretty awful. National economy, weakened. The American dream of social mobility, in some cases, denied. And it reduces our economic creativity. There's one point I want to make which doesn't get talked about a lot, but as the Secretary alluded to the Eisenhower moment, I can't resist. There's a national security component to this as well. The defense industry can't import workers from abroad the way we did at Citigroup. Defense industry workers need national security clearance. They're not going to get it if they're coming from abroad. You only need to look at the cyber attacks that we read about in today's paper to quietly think, how are we going to get enough people out there to take care of this for us? If we don't train them, if we don't make sure they stick with the math, science, and engineering program, they're not going to be there. Cyber attacks on the federal government's personnel files and on the Sony Corporation did more harm than Sputnik ever did, and Eisenhower got the federal government into the national defense student loan business. And that was why. And that was why. It is an Eisenhower moment, I submit, but for a different reason. I want to add, I, I, I want to think about these issues of apprenticeship slightly differently. Um, I was a school's chancellor of the largest system in America. At the time I was there, it was 1,100,000 children. I focused relentlessly on the bottom. I wanted to get as many kids as I could to pass those exit exams to get a high school diploma because we all know what it means, you know, better life, better health, better family, more stability, less criminalization. That's what a high school diploma represents. But it's not enough. By focusing exclusively on getting all children to proficiency, we lose sight of the special needs of the poor, smart ones. We need certification programs, traditional online, MOOCs, competency-based, but that's not enough. We also need to ensure creativity and nimbleness of mind 
because we need to run to where the ball is thrown and not where it is today. Career preparedness does not mean static training. Today's employer needs must be met, but the employer himself, herself, doesn't even know today what the skills they will need tomorrow. And that's what we also have to keep focus on. So I submit to you, we need identification, we need pathways, and we need accountability. It's intellectual development, not just labor preparedness. It's both. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, I regret to say that I've just been passed multiple notes saying that we are running out of time in this session, so I don't think there's going to be time for governor questions, but I would encourage my colleagues uh, to talk with you both uh, outside of this. I have found this very illuminating, and I thank you both for the excellent work you're doing. It's so important to all of us and to our country and our states. Thank you.